Hey, it's John Reed. I'm back from the Acumatica Summit 2023. I've got a fresh podcast for you on the pitfalls and potentials of BI and the evolution of ERP as a data platform, what the problems and opportunities are with that idea. And I think you're going to enjoy it as with data self, Joni Girardi. The only issue with the podcast is I did two recordings, an inferior and a superior recording, and I ended up having to splice the two. So for the first minute and 30 seconds or so, You're going to hear more loudness, a little bit of a loud background, and then we'll transition after that into the better recording for the remainder of the podcast. So it'll switch pretty quick. And then the rest of it's good. There's a little bit of background noise, but we did use lavalier mics. So I think that should be kept to a pretty good minimum. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So here I am at an old school podcast, John Reed. I sought out someone that I've known for a long time who's been tackling data problems for a long time. This is Joni Girardi of Data Self Analytics. How you doing? Doing awesome. Gosh. It was a pleasure. I remember meeting you very, you know, far before the pandemic at like a Dunkin' Donuts outside of the Tableau yes. show. <laughs> I think we might have taped something back then. And the reason I turned to you is because I think there's, I want to talk to you about what's going on at the Acumatica Summit here in Vegas, but this goes deeper. This is, to me, this is like, this major transition that's happening and how customers derive value from ERP. And there's different components to it, but I think one key is moving from kind of a transactional platform, which is the basics, to uh, extracting value from a data platform, which means I've done all this work to to get this data in in a real-time sort of transactional place, but now I need to make better decisions with that data. And this is where I think a lot of customers still feel pain, and that's not unique to Acumatica. So I really want to get your thoughts on that but in general like what do you think about this idea of getting value out of ERP data is is this kind of like has the time come are we there well I've been working on this problem for 20 years I know you have and uh, in my perspective uh, in my experience I'm happy that the last five years I'm seeing uh, a wave of management the old school management is retiring there's a new wave of management that is a lot more data driven I'm already a lot more impatient with things. They cannot wait and they want things now the way that they want it. And in companies, you know, in the, the last 20 years, they have been implementing systems like Acumatica to capture the data. Um, and in these systems like Acumatica, like you said, all of them, they are really good at data input right. in helping what we call process oriented reporting, meaning what the staff needs from a reporting standpoint to do their job one at a time. You know, each one invoice, making a shipment, do a journal entry. So things will re- ro- re- work really well from that perspective. But when management wants to do data analysis, yeah. now you're no longer looking at a microscope, you're looking at a telescope. You need to see data across customers, territories, multiple weeks, months, and, and years, lots of data. And then ERP systems, no matter what they are, they're not focused for the telescope, they're focused on the microscope, and then the pains come. Reports take a long yeah. time to run. It's hard to slice and dice it. And that's the area where usually business intelligence really succeeds, taking the data out of the systems and enabling management to, be, to make more informed decisions. And that's been my journey for 20 years. And in the last five, I'm seeing companies seeing the value in more informed decisions and investing in technology. And that's how I'm funding my kids' college. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting because even with BI, you know, BI has a pretty long history as a discipline, and yet I think you can make the argument that in many, many times it has fallen short of delivering the value, right? Like, I think we get confused a little bit because we see these pretty dashboards, but we're not necessarily making better decisions and and saving our company money or what have you. And so I'd love to hear your view on, like, how we get to this point where, yeah, we have have this data in a user-friendly like uh, visualization system or analytic system, but we're not at value yet. So how do we get there? You should watch my presentation. <laughs> oh, okay, did you do a presentation this week? This uh, actually today I had uh, okay. I had three, but today I had a presentation where I showed the journey to successfully make informed decisions. The journey to successfully make informed yeah. decisions. It has nine steps. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about. All right, them. let's do that. The first one is the business use case. So you need to know the business use case that you need to analyze to eventually have an insight. So that's the beginning of the the, the journey. There's a pain point that you need to see. Second is, where is the data? In many times, the failure is right there. If you don't find the right data, that report at the end of the day is gonna fail because it doesn't have the right data. So finding the data is a problem. Then, 
what is the right tool to get the data into a format that is going to support the decision-making process. So Acumatica has a lot of amazing tools, especially for process-oriented reporting. But sometimes it's not the right tool if the problem is right. not the focus. So tool is a problem. With the bullet number three. Let's remember all of them. Um, then you need to know how to use these tools, right? right. Knowing the to having the tool is a piece, knowing how to use another. Once you know the tool, you know the data, now you need to build a visualization, which alone is an expertise that you build over time. You know, you cannot learn this overnight, so you right. have to learn how to do it. Then you need to know the security to give the right information to the right person. So right. security is another component. Then you need to decide how each person is going to have access to that information. Is it going to be self-service? Is it going to be email? Is it going to be in a, you know, inside of Acumatica? Is another skill set. Then finally, you onboard the user, how to use it, mm -hmm. and then comes usage, mm -hmm. and then comes informed decisions. If right. any of these steps, there is failure or not well covered, guess what? No value. No value, and right. the investment fell, fell apart. Yeah. So it's not easy. Right. It's absolutely no, uh, informed decisions is not an easy problem. It's totally worth it, but if you don't do it right, it's frustrating. Because you invest a lot of money and you don't get it at the end of the day what you need. And and just for listeners to get a sense of this, I mean, you have seriously invested yourself in this problem. Um, in in the you don't only work with Acumatica, but basically for SM, SME companies, you can help them move that data into either Tableau or Power BI. But you've literally built like more than five thousand. I mean, this is like a dizzying amount of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of rich complexity in what you offer, and yet it comes down to helping out the CFO or whoever with that pain that they're having. And so what, what kinds of conversations do you have with these people these days? What, what's on their minds? Uh, our strategy is always to start asking questions. Uh, usually, why are you talking with me, right? If they mm -hmm. stop talking about you know, better reporting, there's usually pain points. And before I can articulate any value, I need to understand exactly what the pain is, to exactly uh, articulate why you're having this pain, in case we know, that, you know, we know what's going on. Uh, so we can articulate exactly why they're having the pain, so they can feel, yes, this person understands my problem. And then, again, assuming that we have a good fit, how this pain, this pain can be solved. Uh, so quite often, a lot of the conversation is just listening, talking, explaining, and eventually, once we pinpoint why the person is having those pains. And if we have the solution, we talk about in the data self stack of components where Tableau and Power BI is the front end, right. how each of these components will address parts of the problem. Right. Uh, many people think that Tableau and Power BI are uh, like magic ones, and by far alone, they usually are not. You need to have the right setup. And all of those things that I told you, you need to know how to connect the dots to eventually deliver the insight, which is the last step of the whole you know, chain. Right. So when we think about like um, your transition in, into what you do now, you were telling me that you've even learned to change the conversation to not that we have to talk beyond data geeks, right? Like that if we're going to solve these enterprise wide problems, we got to empower users, individual lines of business. We can't be data geeks anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's awesome that we are, but we need more, right? Uh, what I would say is, the conversation must be contextual with your audience. Right. If the audience is not technical, you need to know how to talk with them at that level that they can understand what you're solving. Yeah. If the audience is, is tacky, then you have to talk their language. And, and quite often, especially in this market, you always have both. Right. Uh, and then you have to know how to keep the conversation in a way that uh, uh, in a generic conversation, both audiences walk out with a, uh, huh, I think right. this has a solution, and then you can dive into each of these group of people to address their concerns individually to really talk to the language. So it's, it's again, it's understanding the audience, understanding the pains, and, and talking the right language. So what would be a common pain point? I know that every customer is different, but like, uh, you know, an Acumatica CFO, what would be a common pain point that they're having in their business? Uh, it's funny, you know, uh, I started this journey 20 years ago, and the reason that I started 
was because I heard 20 years ago two main pain points that today are still there. Uh, one is the decision makers, you know, the CFO, the CEO, the COO. They usually, comp and summarizing, right, the pain is, I know I have the data. Mm -hmm. Why can I have insights by myself anytime and anywhere? Mm -hmm. This pain is an ongoing problem that we're helping to solve, but 20 years ago and even today, we hear the same things. Mm -hmm. Some people say, no, wow, you have been working for 20 years, you haven't fixed it. <laughs> well, the data, today the data is a lot more problematic than 20 years ago, it's a lot more systems, so there's a reason why you know, it's an ongoing solution, it's an ongoing uh, problem. Uh, the other audience are the business analysts that support the decision makers, they're always running behind. You know, come decision makers asking for a bunch of things, and business analysts you know, keep on going, bringing back, it's, it's a pain for both teams. Um, so typically when we get the business people asking us, there are primarily two main problems. One is what you know is I have the data, I know why can I have the, 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 the insights by myself. And second is about the now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're in a meeting trying to make a decision, if you have the information now, you make a decision and move forward. If you don't, too often they have to wing it. They can you know, postpone the discussion and then you know, wing it the information is not good, they might make bad decisions. So being, being able to deliver a solution that actually can be flexible to allow people to slice and dice the data in seconds, every, every, every interaction, every slice and dicing takes second, is something that to me, when I tell people, yeah, how much data you have, doesn't matter. Our benchmark is if a report takes 11 seconds to run, we're one second too long. Yeah. And the other issue, I guess you maybe don't encounter this quite as much in an Acumatica context, but obviously you say we have the data, but data quality remains an obstacle in a lot of cases. But in at least in Acumatica, they're off of legacy systems, right? So instead of running, you know, 10 versions of QuickBooks like a customer I talked to today, right. like, like at least now it's consolidated into one platform, but data quality is the other issue, right? Data quality is always an issue. Is, a, is an issue that uh, uh, it's uh, once the clients, sorry, once the clients are able to see their data easily, they realize how many data capturing issues they, ha they have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that usually we don't solve, but we show. And, right. and the funny thing is, or the good thing is that um, quite often the decision makers, when they see bad data, some bad data is irrelevant, right. and some bad data is critical. And in the right. past, I've seen too many times that people say, oh, this is bad data, go fix it. And say, no, no, let's ask management of the bad data, what they really care, because sometimes, in my experience, I have some situations where the client spent like, no, 30 grand in a solution that was completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because of the, you know, the, the IT person thought that it was important. He invests a lot of money in solving certain problems that where the problem was solved in like in $2,000. So bad data is critical, but ask management, which of the bad data should be fixed first? So with Acumatica, it's, a, it's an interesting situation because this we talked with a bunch of customers this year, uh, informally and formally, and the Acumatica comms did a fab, fabulous job of getting us in front of a lot of customers, and they were pretty frank with us about what they love about Acumatica and where their challenges are, and the biggest pain point was around reporting. Now, I think part of this is because of what, we're, what we've been talking about. There's a trend towards wanting to derive this value uh, in, in everything. Um, but then I think also it's just the sense that Acumatica is in a transition. They're like, they're working on a new reporting engine, and they're working on that. But I think I think I'd love for you to just give a sense of like how Acumatica customers can think about this because I think one thing I, f I saw in my opinion is I felt like they weren't necessarily getting great advice from their partners on this. And I don't mean to trash any partners, but right. I'm not sure that all the partners that do the implementations are necessarily data platform experts. So, right. so how do we kind of help customers right. move forward with this? Yeah, it's a very good, very good point. Uh, in my opinion as well, uh, is that uh, the like you know, the uh, ERP, like in this case Acumatica, and their VARs, their specialty is again processes. Right. And, and just to do process really well is a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of knowledge. And they invest a ton of resources to be the best that they can at you know, automating and simplifying processes. 
when you start dealing with you know, um, business insights, if you look from a technology standpoint, it's a different problem with a different technology knowledge. Right. So most VARs, if you look in the, in, the, in the IT industry, in the technology industry, either you see companies who are specialized in processes like ERP, CRM or not, or in BI. They're usually right. two different groups of people. Right. Uh, very distinct, you know, different companies, different vendors, different VARs. Uh, we, DataSelf, are one of the few vendors that actually touch both sides. And it's kind of challenging in a way because we have to try to tell the people who are experts in processes that uh, data analysis, you need a different set of tools, tools to do the job well. And over time, we start to become effective of showing the, you know, the limitations of the process-oriented uh, framework. Uh, so to me, in a way, it's a lot of, about education. And in, in one of the visions of data self is how we can make ERP VARs successful with BI without necessarily having data geeks as part of their team. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a moving target. I think we're making a lot of progress, but it, you know, it's, it's a different focus. Yeah, I would, love, I would love to see more open conversations happening about this, not just in the Acumatica community, but elsewhere as far as sometimes if, if, you're, if you don't have that skill internally that you can connect with the right advisors, the data selves of the world or whoever, because uh, you know, customers are, are, are struggling some with this at times. And we talked to one customer who had, who had actually moved on-premise in order to handle their reporting better. And it felt like to me, my opinion, I didn't feel like they were getting the most awesome advice about that. So anyway, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. Tell me about um, the the great what I call the great dashboard debate. Yeah, I, dashboards are one of the most divisive things in the circles I travel in because I'm a pretty big believer in dashboards, particularly once once you can get to the level of role based dashboards where both executives but also line of business managers and teams. When you can like wake up in the morning, talk with a customer that's done this, where the different departments have their own role-based dashboards in Acumatica. Uh, I talked to a different vendor. Their customer is doing that with shop floor folks so they can kind of see, they don't have to go down the shop floor anymore. So I'm a believer in that, but there's also a lot of people that say, well, dashboards don't necessarily lead to better actions, better decisions. So. I think it's an interesting debate, and and one thing I will grant is that sometimes it's not enough. Like, like to me, dashboards work best in the context of a more robust infrastructure around that in terms of things like alerts, right? Role-based alerts that ping you about certain things, and of course, the promise of artificial intelligence around eventually creating prescriptive actions as well, right? So, hey, not only is this trending yellow from, from green, but here's some things most likely actions you might want to take. So what is your thought on this sort of dashboard debate? That could be a whole conversation. <laughs> yes, it could be. <laughs> well, my point, if I go back to those nine, eight, nine points that I told you initially, yeah. a lot of the failures of business intelligence initiatives is because people miss some of those steps. Right. And to me, a lot of the dashboard, they, they fail to deliver is not because dashboards are not working, is because the people who put them together didn't think through the whole process in a way that the end user that you're designing the dashboard, dashboard for really cares. Mm -hmm. And this is really freaking hard because um, one of the challenges of, of, of visualizations to the users is usually someone tells the, you know, the, the, the business use case, right? Usually get the, the feedback and then you get this long process of someone technical to go through all of those loops and hoops to eventually bring back the solution. In many times, um, that dashboard is not for one person. It's for a group of people. And then usually I tell people the success of a dashboard is based on the usage and eventually the information that people get out of the usage. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make this process highly interactive, where the BI people are monitoring, see what's, hap what's working, what's not working, and who is actually doing what, in learning from those successes mm -hmm. and failures and feeding back into the others. And this is not a technology problem. This is a human problem. And many times this part of the process doesn't, doesn't uh, feed back into the, the redesign, the readjustment, and then people say, yeah, it doesn't work. 
So to me, is that the complexity of, I mean, the failure of some of these projects is because the processes to get them right are not well thought out and they're not um, circled until you get it right. It's totally worth it, but it's not simple. So since you specialize in dashboards and KPIs and metrics, how do you approach this from your own clients and projects? How do you measure your success? Mm -hmm. Is there, do you agree upon certain metrics with your customers or does it vary by customer? How does that go? Good question. <clears throat> um, so, so first of all, um, when you mentioned that we have our library of 5,000, now it's 8,000, just to... Oh, you're up to 8,000 <laughs> yes. now, sorry. So, okay, you built 3,000 since the last time we talked. I I've guess. been doing some work. You, my, were my, the, my, you were busy team. during the pandemic, weren't you? <laughs> yes, unfortunately. <laughs> we don't have a life, so... Actually, it came up in Google as 5,000, too. So you might, you got to update your uh, Google uh, uh, yes. description. But our, anyhow. Actually, our marketing is always behind our product, which is yeah. usually the opposite. But that's not a bad thing. <laughs> anyway, it's more than 5,000, it's just a lot more. But well, anyhow, go on. Yes, but uh, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the this library because some, for some for many people when they hear this they get you know scared about oh my god you know it's a lot that I cannot digest it and let me make a little articulate uh, articulate the, the vision of this library. Uh, our uh, eight thousand library is really a library. You know you don't need to read eight thousand. It's like when you go to a library you're not going to read all the books. You're going to which books you're going to see. Then if you have more books you're going to more likely find the books that you need. So I always tell people that when they start their, to invest more in their KPI journey, one of the questions is, do you have a wish list, KPI wish list? And they usually they have some already. Hey, mm -hmm. we were trying to do this forever, we don't have it. I guarantee that a portion of their current KPI wish list is solved as is or very closely with this library. Right. So the library has been built out of um, crowdsourcing with other clients asking financial questions and sales questions and whatnot. So usually a portion of the KPI wish list is fulfilled by the, by the, um, the KPI library. But then there's always many KPIs that are not ready, that are customized. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is with data self, without data self, uh, if you invest with the right resources and the right technology, eventually you're gonna get your KPIs done right and it's gonna be worth it if you do it you know, the right, right way. With data self, our main vision, if I were to summarize in a single sentence, is to fast track your business intelligence. Mm -hmm. And think about that sentence. Fast track business intelligence, all, after all that I told you before, it's not easy, you gotta do all of these things, and the technology, and the processes, it's a lot of things to do. And if you start from scratch, and you have the resource and time and people that stay with you, eventually you'll do it. But with data self, we usually can shortcut the process significantly. We have processes, we have people, we have tools. And one of my goals is to teach them how, teach them how to fish. You know, the idea is the more independent they are, the better. Many companies, they don't have the resources. We have to keep on supporting them for a while, but um, uh, it is it's a, it's a worthwhile journey to me. Um, uh, explaining to them how it works, explaining how our tools, our templates help and our processes has been very successful. So yeah, I, I, that part about short, shortening the process to proper KPIs makes a lot of sense. Sounds like there's another component too around uh, freeing people to the point of, of self-service BI, which is sort of the dream, right? Is that, right. Is that eventually I'm independently um, a, a BI power user. It's kind of the equivalent of low code hype, but for right. a BI, right? That you, right. Be, that you, if you do things right as data self, you empower customers to do that, right? right. Is that? Yes, yes. And uh, let me articulate because this is a, it's a very good question. Uh, about half of our clients, um, we deploy them in little time, sometimes in about an hour. You know, deployment is, is, is simple. But many of these clients, they have fairly, uh, I would call non-sophisticated data problems mm -hmm. from our standard, right? In the out of the box, as is, or with little tweaks, we teach them how to use the out of the box, we teach them how to use Tableau Power BI UI, and they only call us when they're doing upgrades of Acumatic or the, the, the ERP or some major changes, but they usually just run with it, right? Mm -hmm. It's really self-service. 
the other half of the clients, then they're usually the more, they have more elaborate data problems, and then there's usually a lot more invest, investment in the, with the BI team, hours or theirs to actually tweak it, redesign, sometimes it's completely from scratch. But um, uh, having about half of our client base reaching a level of self-sufficiency without getting any data geek in-house, it's, it's something to be proud of. We're really happy with that. Uh, yeah, very cool. So one more thing, I want to hear your take on the impact of artificial intelligence on your field. Obviously, there's a big thing around predictive analytics, but as I, as I discussed, I, I'm interested in this prescriptive actions type scenario where you're not necessarily making decisions for users. I think we're very far from that for most decisions, but where you're at least alerting them and guiding them towards possible um, think, scenarios they should be considering. Do you think this is a, a, a big deal, little deal? Do you care? Do you not care? How does this affect your future? Well, in our client base, to me, for, uh, usually for artificial intelligence to really bring the value, you need volume. Right. Right? And of course, the Amazons, the, uh, you know, the Walmarts, these companies have the volume that definitely AI is an amazing way to find things that humans would spend so much time to, to figure that out. Right. Uh, in the mid-market, sometimes when people ask me if we have AI and we ask the why, usually they don't need the AI. They actually need to understand their business better. They need right. more information to eventually realize what they need. So to me, AI is still a very promising market, very promising technology for the mid-market. I think they, there's still not enough volume for the current AI framework. And in the future, as AI can actually do its magic with less data, Right. or these companies grow bigger, then AI is going to be more uh, uh, helpful. Of course, we are already using AI in machine learning. If you look at the Blowing Power BI, there's many features like natural language and whatnot that already has some components, right. but it's scratching the surface of what people think about AI over this technology that you don't have to do anything. They tell you what to do. We're far yeah. from that point. Yeah, I, I can see the obvious potential benefits, but... This question of like training on smaller data sets is definitely uh, still somewhat of an unresolved issue for sure. Well, it will be interesting to see see where it goes because, like, I I do like the idea of, I mean, to me, my favorite sort of vision of AI is, I mean, obviously there's some things that can be automated, but in general, I like this notion of. Machines are good at some things. Humans are mostly good at others. There's there's a little bit of overlap, but not a lot right now. So why don't I have like a virtual machine assistant that helps me do the things I'm not as good at, right? Like to me, and and I and I would look at that from from BI as well, right? Where obviously, and that's why it, things like anomaly detection and data outliers, yeah. yeah, data quality type stuff, right? Where yeah. it's like. I might not flag that, but 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 the the machine might. Even if the machine doesn't, even if it doesn't understand it, it can start to help me by to, to show up, yep, the by flagging things, yep. and then I can decide how important it is. And, but yeah, it will be interesting to see about the small data problem because I've run into some companies that think that they that they have solved solved that a little bit. Mm. Um, but to your point, it's when you look at the really classic examples, I mean, even the whole fervor over chat GPT right now, that chat GPT basically sucked up an entire internet's worth of data to do what it's doing. <laughs> so most of the examples that are popularized right now are definitely big data AI examples. So yep. we, we do have uh, in our roadmap, and probably it's gonna be 2024, uh, we already are looking at um, BI to help the extraction process. Uh, we uh, last year, 2022, 75 percent of our sales were completely cloud-based. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we had nothing to install on the client; it was all cloud to cloud. Or if we had to install something on the client on premises, it was just a little extraction tool to get the data to our cloud, and then everything is 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 in our you know infra cloud infrastructure, AWS, Azure, and and then many times we see uh, extraction issues. Uh, performance issues or hiccups, you know, system failures, and 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 <clears throat> many times uh, um, when we have these issues, our team that is involved with the client might not know 
the problem, and then sometimes it goes by you know hours, days, or even weeks before we find the right person, the team that will go there. To, oh, you have to check this box to fix that problem. This kind of you know challenge in the data extraction today is manual, and I strongly believe that uh, next year we're going to be able to add AI layer to our machine learning AI layer to our uh, extraction process where we can see out of you know thousands of extraction processes. If this is having a certain issue that we had in the past, probably the problem is this checkbox that you didn't check. So I do see that AI machine learning for those very specialized things that you can have the skill that we have to see trends across the process and start to help maintenance, at least initially. But eventually data quality, yeah, there's a lot of potential, but we're still not there from that standpoint. Next year, we'll talk again. Conversation yes. for next year. Indeed. So just on a final note with Acumatica, I think the other interesting thing is that the Acumatica does a really good job of extending in, you know, with partners and having partners play an important role. The morale of the partner community, I think, in Acumatica is about as strong and good as any partner community. But there still has to be trust, and I think that's the thing I would ask you about because if a customer chooses you in conjunction with Acumatica, they're counting on you just as much as they are Acumatica going forward. Do you think you, you have a good situation as far as how that works with Acumatica and yourself? We are very, uh, we work close with Acumatica. Uh, we've been working with them since uh, 2017. Yeah. Uh, we have invested thousands of hours of our product development to make the Acumatica BI extraction of data or not data more mm -hmm. efficient. And when you look at the the competition we have, there's many good, you know, BI companies. Uh, I feel really strong that uh, the partnership with Acumatica, we are at the top of the game, and this partnership will continue going really well. So I'm, I'm cool. Yep. Well, that's good news for customers because uh, their challenges in this area are are definitely going to need to get solved, and and that's a great. And it's like, well, you know, it's. It's that flip side of the coin, right? Challenge opportunity in this case is like totally intertwined, right? Yeah. Like, like the pain they're feeling is proportional to the good result they can have. And the so value, I keep yeah. encouraging them to talk with you and to, you know, to really take a broad look at what's out there in terms of the reporting and analytics possibilities for themselves. So, but what I really wanted to talk to you about was what we covered, which is, I didn't know you had nine steps for me, but that's great because that, you know, where are we getting stuck? And now we have a better idea. So thanks, thanks for giving us the lowdown. No, again, you know, uh, helping people understand where things are failing yeah. is the first step to help them figure it out. And sometimes they figure it out by themselves. Right. That's good. But I know that uh, solving problem, data problems is not easy. And if you don't have a, an amazing data geek team like I do, yeah. the video will come back. So I, I'm, I'm happy to share. Cool. knowledge. <laughs> All right. Well, to be revisited, but thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Always. Cool.